My name is Daniel. I work for a company called Datadog. Maybe you've heard of us. Uh, before I begin, actually, I just want to say uh, a big thank you to the uh, local team here for inviting me out again to speak. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, I actually had the pleasure and the honor of keynoting the first DevOps days Cape Town so many moons ago. And it's very, very exciting to be back and to see how the scene here has evolved and, and moved forward. So before I begin, if I could get a big round of applause for the local organizing team for putting on such a great show. <laughs> Seriously, it's just top notch, top notch. Okay, so let's get started. Again, my name is Daniel, and this is what MMA taught me about working in tech. Uh, it's highly likely that you know what the word tech means. If you don't, we can have a chat about that afterwards. But it's possible that you might not know what the acronym MMA stands for. It could be anything, right? Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. So let's actually just do a quick primer on that so we can all start from exactly the same base. MMA stands for Mixed Martial Arts, and it's defined very simply as mixing techniques from multiple disciplines together. That's it. Anything else you might have thought MMA stood for, you're wrong. It's just this. It's just, let's take punching and kicking and grappling and some other things and then make a new thing out of it. Great. That's what MMA is. Super. MMA, by the way, is not new. The term is new. This idea of hybrid martial arts is not. In fact, if we look back through ancient history, there are tons and tons of examples of this. Two of the most well-documented, and I mean very well-documented examples, are Pancration and Leitai. Pancration actually comes from ancient Greece. It was one of the original Olympic sports, and it was done for like literally 100 years. And the whole idea here was that two men would strip down and get oiled up and fight until one of the two of them didn't want to fight anymore, <laughs> right? There weren't a lot of rules. There were some rules, but there weren't a lot of rules, uh, except it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. There were no weapons, or generally wasn't to the death either, hence it being a sport. Then there's also Lei Tai, <laughs> which uh, uh, comes from ancient China. Uh, Lei Tai was interesting because there uh, it was used oftentimes to settle scores, and you could use weapons and things, and that was oftentimes to the death. Uh, but it was also big money. People would bet on it, um, which I guess made it a sport, kind of Van Damme style, blood sport, right? Pretty cool. The important thing here is that MMA conceptually is not new. It's been around for a very, very long time. And, and, and thinking about to more recent history, uh, the idea of mixed discipline matches, right? Say, for example, let's get a boxer and a judoka and put them in a ring and see what happens. It became very, very popular in the 1800s basically as a result of the rise of mobility for humanity in the 1800s and steamships and trains and so on and so forth. And so what happens when people from all around the world find that they have a newfound ability to travel the world? They get together and they beat each other up. <laughs> so the idea of mixed discipline matches became really popular and, and this gave rise to the idea of a more codified uh, discipline system. So new martial arts were invented in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, American, for example, out of Japan, Sambo. Uh, sambo, by the way, is what happens when you put boxers and, and judokas together. Shoot and catch wrestling, which eventually led to Hulk Hogan. Pancrace. Uh, Jeet Kune Do, as in, yeah, we da! Right, Bruce Lee, all right, is actually a hybrid martial art invented in recent history. And also Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, which is a really, really important one, BJJ, is the acronym, so I love an acronym, we all do, we're technical people. So BJJ is cool because it's actually one of the founding disciplines of contemporary mixed martial arts, to give you an idea of this continuum, this constant evolution as we move forward. Thinking now to contemporary history, uh, the idea of MMA as we understand it today actually began with a one-day tournament held in, back in 1993, called the Ultimate Fighting Championships, one-day tournament. A couple of dudes came into a ring, and it was like a cage. It was shaped like an octagon. Nobody had ever seen it before. It's really cool. Uh, the phrase MMA didn't exist. Uh, they didn't invent it, as it turns out. They called it no holds barred. They called it cage fighting. They didn't know what to call it. MMA was actually a news reference to it. Basically, uh, at that time, print newspaper didn't like the idea of putting cage fighting into the newspaper, <laughs> and so they called it MMA, or Mixed Martial Arts. 
Uh, interestingly enough, for the keeners in the audience, you may recognize the, the phrase Ultimate Fighting Championship, or its acronym UFC. Uh, UFC is today the Champions League of martial arts, uh, mixed martial arts leagues. There are others around the world that's kind of the big one. Uh, also, as I mentioned, this was originally just a one-day tournament held in 1993. For some people in the audience today, uh, you weren't alive in 1993. Uh, I, however, was an incredibly impressionable teenager in 1993, and I saw this and went, that looks like a good idea. <laughs> so, um, that segues me into the next slide, which is a little bit about me <laughs> and why I'm an authority on these two topics. <laughs> I have <laughs> been hospitalized by both tech and MMA. Uh, both of those are interesting stories, and if you want to grab a beer later today, I can tell you about how both of those happened. <laughs> um, but So a little bit about me. Uh, I am a recovering system administrator. <laughs> and <laughs> And alongside Bridget, who spoke yesterday morning, one of the global organizers uh, of DevOps Days, so you're welcome. <laughs> All right. A little bit about the company I work for, standard, this is the company I work for slide. All right. Uh, Datadog is a monitoring, a modern monitoring and analytics company comprising monitoring, analytics, logs, APM, tracing, synthetics, and more. <laughs> we rubbed some machine learning on it, it's fine, you're gonna like it. Uh, P.S. We're hiring and we do sponsor visas in both the European Union and the United States of America. Moving right along, I want to address the elephant in the room, all right, the elephant in the room, uh, which is MMA. Is it just two people beating each other up? Is that's, okay, yeah, and as long as we're making up poor definitions for things, let us define programming as pressing plastic squares in more or less the right order. <laughs> All right, because that, that's what it is, right? Like, I'm a programmer, no idea what I'm doing. Uh, you know, the cool part about this is if you, if you do them in the right order more often than the wrong order, people will hand you money, <laughs> which <laughs> is really cool. Um, but seriously, I mean, do think about this, right? Think about all the things you have to know in order to do your job. Right? To, to, to press those squares in the right order, it's actually kind of a big deal. You know, you, you have to think about all the things you've had to learn over the years, from, from school, from books, from other people, all the experiences you've had to live, all the different jobs you had to do, and people you've had to listen to, and planning you've and so on, makes mistakes you've had to make and, and, and learn from. It's astounding, right? It never ends. It's a constant learning. It's constant evolution. And the crazy part about it is that it's not just you, right? Uh, when we're talking about the jobs that we do, when we're talking about the lives that we live, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. And uh, when we work in the technological industry, just like when, when we train in MMA, we, we work with people, right? It's, 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 it's not necessarily a team sport. Programming's not a team sport. Yeah, well, mob programming and so forth aside, I suppose. So it's an individual activity, but it, but it takes place in a much larger context. And that actually leads us to learning number one, which is that people matter, right? You have to surround yourself with the right people. This is critical. This is one of the things that, that I brought when I was like, well, I want to do computers for a living, uh, you know, from the training world. So we have coaches and training partners in MMA, and that's kind of like having managers and, and, and co-workers. And that seems obvious. Why is this on a slide? But when I talk about the right people, really what I'm talking about is also the wrong people. And it's important to identify those people and avoid them. Okay, and, and who are these people? Uh, toxic personalities. We've heard a lot of talk about toxic personalities and toxicity in the workplace. And that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And I'm not saying that I have all the answers, right? This is a very personal talk, so take everything about to a grain of salt, okay? I'm gonna try my best, all right? But I'm one human being, I don't have all the answers. When I talk about toxic personalities, especially in the gym, I'm basically talking about dudes that just want to hurt you. All right? And I've encountered a lot of these people, right? Just these big alpha males, they come into the gym, and all they want to do is punch you, and punch you, and punch you. And God, it sucks! Because you learn nothing, they learn nothing, and somebody gets hurt at the end of the day. All right? That's it. That's a toxic personality, okay? And same thing like in the workplace the so-called uh, archetype of the brilliant jerk, right, who can produce 10x code 
and you know, lives on caffeine and, and works all night. Short-term gain, long-term loss. All right, that person's impossible to work with, their code is impossible to maintain, they learn nothing, you learn nothing, and somebody ends up going to the hospital. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna give you an example to illustrate what I mean by this. So toxic people breed you know, toxic environments, and one of the ways that I identified this a long time ago is I was actually rolling at a gym, it was a grappling gym, right? So we're doing you know, wrestling, Right? It's not the punching, it's the, the grappling and the submissions and so on and so forth. And uh, this gym had a bunch of dudes in it and one woman. All right? And she was not very big. This is important to the story. Because the problem is, is that whenever she rolled, which is you know, learning to, to grapple, uh, she was technically proficient, but the much larger men in the group would just power out of everything. Right? So she'd you know, slap on a hold and just be like, eh get off me, right? There's no technique, we're not learning anything, we're just powering over, right? So it wasn't good for them, it wasn't good for her. It was my turn to roll, and she said, can we concentrate on technique? And I said, that's not a problem. I'll just lower you know, my, my, my power output down, we'll work slowly, we'll go through the motions, and actually it was super, super great experience. I learned a lot about body dynamics and how to transition between you know, different maneuvers and different holds, we had a really great time, and of course, because she was technically very good, she put me in a couple submissions and I tapped out. And that was really, really fun, right? Because you learn from that. After that, I became known as the guy that got submitted by a girl. That shouldn't be an insult, all right? If it is an insult, you are in a toxic place filled with toxic people, all right? That's an example, okay? So toxic people, as I said, breed toxic environments. And that brings me on to learning number two, which is the importance of the right environment, all right? And for me, when I talk about the right environment, I'm defining it as a safe space to make mistakes and learn new things, right? And there's a lot of ways to define the right environment. This is how I like to define it. A safe space to make mistakes and learn new things. A good gym will enable this, right? So will a good workplace. A good workplace will enable this. The opposite will crush you, all right? Either, either mentally, emotionally, physically, all right? You need that safe space to make mistakes and learn things. And I'm gonna give you an example. This is the rhythm we're gonna be following from here on out. The example actually is from Datadog, and I won't mention my company again after this, I promise. But the company that I work for has a, a post-mortem process, which is really cool. Uh, has anybody here ever done a post-mortem at their places of employment? Yeah, good, good. Excellent, happy to see about half the hands. So what the idea behind a post-mortem process is that whenever something goes wrong, right, there's a production outage or there's data loss or like, you know, whatever errant behavior occurs in, in the complex systems that we're hired to design and create and maintain, uh, we actually have a codified process where the information is gathered in the process and you know, we, we, we work through the issue, we come up with why it happened, we try to s solve the problem and then figure out how to prevent it from happening in the future. What's interesting about this is that that report is made available to everybody inside of the company internally, right? It's not behind some closed walled garden somewhere. And in fact, it's mailed out to the entire company every time it happens. I get post-mortems four or five times a week in my inbox. So does everyone else in the company, from salespeople to secretaries, you name it, all right? And once a month, we have a post-mortem roundup where we have an all hands and everybody gets together and we talk about the most interesting stuff that broke that month and what we learned from it. And the idea here is to eliminate the stigma of making mistakes, right? And to show that we can learn and grow and improve from this process. This is really cool. This is something I really like about where I work. Where I work is not perfect. Nowhere is, but I like this. And when I talk about the safe space to make mistakes, and, and improve and learn and grow, this is sort of the thing I'm talking about. Now, it's funny because I wasn't aware of this in my professional life for a long time. Although I had brought this from uh, you know, the fight game, this idea of understanding the right environment and, and the right people, I, I didn't translate it into my work life. And it wasn't until much later in life it started to permeate my consciousness uh, that it was important to choose where I worked and who I worked with, and I stopped chasing the most impressive logos or, or the most you know, prestigious title. And even if it meant a little less money uh, or, or a little less impressive line on my CV, uh, 
Um, by the way, I don't count Datadog in this list <laughs> because it's a pretty impressive logo and I get paid very well. But <laughs> prior to that, it was a, a massive quality of life improvement, which was really, really cool. So safe spaces. Speaking of quality of life, uh, learning number three, the value of project management. Project management. You think, how could that be a quality of life issue? Well, the fact of the matter is that organizing your time and your effort is key. It's super, super important, right? Being able to organize yourself and how you spend your time and expend your energy, that's a quality of life issue. When we talk about project management, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about organizing yourself and your time and your effort. So imagine you've got an upcoming product launch. I'll just, we'll put out that hypothesis. You've got an upcoming product launch. Uh, a date has been set. Commitments have been made. Right? Possibly to shareholders, to customers, to the to people around you. It's, the data is locked in. It's going to happen whether you're ready or not. All right? So, what you need to do is get ready. Right? How you spend your time and expend your effort between now and the launch matters. And you want to optimize that for various values of optimization. It's kind of like having a fight lined up. I've been in both of these scenarios, so there we go. Uh, before a fight, we go into what's called a camp. I don't know why it's called this. It's called a training camp. So we go into a camp. And the idea is, is that you sit down with your coaching staff and you figure out what you're going to do between now and then. All right? And that includes a lot of stuff at a, at a very high level. At the, at the highest echelons, at the professional level, you might go be isolated up at Big Bear and all your meals are prepared for you and you got to get on a hydration program and blah, blah, blah. But I've never done any of that. Uh, so w the camps that I've done are really just figuring out how to train beforehand. You want to vary your intensity. Sometimes you want a high intensity workout, low intensity workout, do some technical work, do some heavy bag work. And then you also want to build in, and this is super important, recovery time. Okay? Because as you approach the fight day, as you approach that, you know, I'm stepping into a, you know, a ring, an arena, whatever it is, okay? And there's another person across from me, and that person across from me wants to hurt me, right? I want to enter into that as close to 100% as possible. So as I approach fight day, I'm actually reducing my intensity. I'm reducing the possibility that I'm going to get injured. Right? I don't want new injuries. I don't want to exacerbate old ones. I want to make sure I stay on weight. Right? It's very important. And I enter a sort of a maintenance mode. And I enter a zone of confidence. Right? It's a mental more than it is physical as I approach the fight day. And this, for me, is actually a lot like entering a product launch, right? You don't want to be, for example, trying to knock out new features two days before you're supposed to go live, all right? Because that's just making new injuries. That's all you're doing there, right? You don't want to be monkey patching old code three hours before you go live because that's just exacerbating old injuries. What you want is a little bit of work parceled out into sane components, right? Uh, and you want to organize that into two-week blocks. This is what we do in training camp. Two-week blocks. Where have we seen <laughs> this before? <laughs> Turns out, <laughs> Agile is just training for a fight. <laughs> All right? And that's actually the first time I ever encountered the idea of a sprint, as in Agile, was, was actually in a camp. This idea of organizing two-week blocks. And I was like, this is a really cool idea. I like organizing myself for the fight this way because I know what I have to do and I know what my goals are and I know what my, you know, milestones are and I've got my KPIs and maybe I could work like this. And I went back to my team, the company I was working at the time was in the video games industry, and I said, hey, everybody, I've got this cool way we could organize ourselves. Look at this chart. And they all went, that's great. That's way better than the garbage we're doing right now. And so we're like, this is super. We're inventing a new. We're going to write a book. Right? This is awesome. And we took this to our manager, and our manager went, wow, this is amazing. Let's do a presentation to the director. We took that to the director, and the director went, you invented Agile? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> the problem, of course, uh, was that at that time, I was not uh, sleeping very much because I was training full-time and working full-time, which I do not recommend doing. And that brings us to learning number four, which is the value of getting enough rest. <laughs> All right? Uh, you need to sleep and you need to rest. These two things are not the same and you need both of them. Now, in the fight game, not enough sleep 
means you're going to have a tired mind, you're going to have a tired body. And that increases your risk of injury, which is bad, and it decreases your training effectiveness, which is also bad because it's a waste of time for you. All right, so you have to build in the idea of, of, of resting, and again, that's, that's sleep and downtime. And it's the same thing in tech, honestly, right? You need to sleep, you need to rest. If you aren't well rested, my timer, by the way, just turned off over here. If I could have someone turn that back on, please. All I can see is, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, it increases your risk of making bad decisions when you're tired, right? If you're tired, you make bad decisions. Now, we're knowledge workers. Our jobs are to make more good decisions than bad ones. And if that ratio goes off, you're not doing your job anymore. End of story, right? It also decreases your code quality. Staying up all night once in a while, especially if you're feeling inspired, you get through a crunch, that's fine, we've all done it, okay? But making that a lifestyle choice is no good for you, it's no good for your employer, it's not gonna work out in the long term. You, you need to sleep and you need to rest, and those are different things, right? That downtime is critical. It's not just going to bed for X number of hours a night. You also need to not do computers sometimes. You have to let your brain do other things. You have to rebuild your serotonin levels, okay? That's super critical because if you don't, it leads to burnout. Now, burnout's a real thing. It's a real physiological thing, and there are a number of factors that cause it, which are you know, psychological in nature, emotional in nature, but, but also physical in nature, right? And, and sleep and, and rest can, can help prevent burnout. The tricky and, and pernicious thing about burnout is that you don't know it's happening, right? It's impossible to be objective about burnout. You, you don't know what's happening to you. Okay, and that's the importance of having the right people in the right environment, right? When, when you're getting burnt out, you need somebody to go, hey, you, you need to slow down and I'm going to help you slow down, right? Uh, burnout, by the way, is a huge subject and everybody should know more about it. And it's way outside of scope <laughs> for the remainder of, of this presentation, but I do want to direct you to uh, Jason Yee, who has an excellent talk on the topic, and also Matt Stratton out of PagerDuty, who has a, a whole talk about PTSD in tech, so go on the YouTubes and search for Jason Yee and Matt Stratton. And I realized that as lighthearted as this whole presentation started, that we're now getting into the serious stuff. Welcome to DevOps days. Burnout's kind of like overtraining, all right? Uh, and this is something that happens to basically everybody in the fight game, is, is when you're training and you're training hard, it feels good. You get addicted right to, to the, the activity. You get addicted to hitting the heavy bag. You, you know, you get addicted to pushing yourself and pushing yourself and pushing yourself. And the problem is, is that everybody's got limits, but you don't know where they are. And everybody's limits are different places, right? Emotional limits, physical limits, biological limits, physiological limits, right? Re limits to your, what people around you are willing to sustain from your obsession, okay? The cult, of, the cult of overtraining in MMA is, is deep and pernicious and, and everybody falls into it because it feels like you're working. And when you feel like you're working, then you think, I'm doing the right thing. The same thing with the cult of never sleep in tech. You have these startup founders, I only sleep nine minutes a night and when I wake up, I look at 27 screens. <sighs> All right. <laughs> You need to take care of yourself, and, and rest is a part of that. Um, but also, you know, your diet's a part of that, and that leads me actually to learning number five, which is diet is everything, all right? Diet is everything. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I play one on TV. <laughs> I am not a dietitian. Uh, I'm not a biologist, all right? I'm not, I'm not a chemist, okay? I don't know what you should eat. I have no idea. I barely know what I should eat. All right, but there's one thing I can tell you with absolute and total certainty, and that's what and how you eat matters, okay? What and how you eat matters. It's different for everyone, but it matters, okay? And in the MMA game, and, and I suspect in uh, uh, professional sports in, in general, although I've never done anything else professionally. Uh, we think about food and, and drink and everything we consume, 
okay, in three ways. Quality, quantity, and timing. So quality is the actual nutritive content of the food, you know, calories, fiber, vitamins, and things of this nature, right? Oligo elements. There's the quantity, which is how much of it you're consuming, both at an individual ingestion point as well as over time. All right, so different ways of thinking about this. And there's also timing. Now, timing is the tricky one. And uh, I don't think I've ever gotten it right in my life because I just don't care. But there's a way to think about food. So say you like uh, fizzy drinks, you know, Coca-Cola, Fanta, things of this nature. If you wake up in the morning and you drink a liter of Coca-Cola, which is a thing you could do, that will have a different effect on you and your body than if you did that at lunchtime, than if you did that at dinner time, than if you did that right before you went to bed. It's the same object, but when you consumed it matters. And also, please don't drink a liter of Coca-Cola at once. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, you do you, all right? <laughs> okay. um, the important thing is to balance your meal plan out, and, and I'm going to give you a, a, a piece of generally good advice on this, okay? It's a quote by a guy named Michael Pollan who has some ideas about some things. Uh, I encourage you to <laughs> look, look him up and go, oh boy, uh, that's some rabbit hole stuff. But he had this to say about food. Eat food, not too much mostly plants, it is generally good advice. Now, everybody's got different dietary needs and concerns, and I'm, I'm not trying to discount that, okay? And if you like to eat meat, eat meat. I love meat, I love a steak. By the way, I've had a really good steak since I've been here. Uh, I always eat well here in Cape Town, actually. Y'all have a great food scene, seriously. I, I, I completely disregard my own rules on eating when I'm here, which is <laughs> really, really fun. But don't... <laughs> But don't forget to enjoy yourself sometimes, all right? And that's, that's important. You need to have an emotionally healthy relationship with, with food and drink. And uh, I did not, for a very, very long time, have an emotionally healthy relationship with food and drink. And it's actually something that stemmed from training and being obsessed with training, is I had an unhealthy relationship with food, uh, an eating disorder, right? Simple fact. And uh, I eat something you struggle with and will struggle with for the rest of my life, right? It doesn't go away, you just learn to deal with it. Eating disorders are rampant in professional sports, rampant. And I'm discovering, sadly, more and more rampant in technology. The number of people that I've encountered over the years that I've worked with all around the world that do not have a healthy relationship with food and drink is, is growing. Um, I, I'm not a psychologist, I can't help you with this, but if you feel like maybe this is something you want to explore and, and talk more about, feel free to hit me up. We can commiserate and, and see if we can come up to a solution together. Whew, that's heavy stuff, right? That's heavy stuff. Tell you what, <clears throat> why don't we lighten the mood a little bit, right? We thought, ah, oh, Danny came up on stage and we were laughing and everything, and now I just feel bad about that time I drank a liter of Coke, <laughs> Jesus. My God, <laughs> right? So let's lighten up the mood a little bit. We're going to bring the energy level back up and move on to learning number six, which is to learn the basics, right? We have a saying in the fight game, which is that fundamentals win fights. Fundamentals win fights. Uh, no matter whatever sort of flashy techniques you're interested in, you want to do some sort of, you know, Bruce Lee, flying spinning back kick, Mortal Kombat, flying arm bars and stuff. Cool. <laughs> I would love to do all that stuff. That sounds great. The problem is, is that all those things are counterproductive at best and, and dangerous, frankly, at worst, if you don't back them up with you know, solid fundamentals, right? Like, can you throw a jab? Like, do you know how to prevent yourself from getting punched in the face? All right, there's no sense trying to do some sort of triple kick off the top ropes unless you know how to do that, right? You need to back these things up. And, in the, and, and I, when I was younger and I was in the tech game, I only wanted to do the, the crazy stuff, right? Maybe the young people today, they all just want to do the newest JavaScript uh, framework or something. I don't even, <clears throat> I don't even. But, <laughs> you know, when I was in the game and, and what was new when I was getting in the game was PHP, to give you an idea, <laughs> right? Who here remembers CGI bin? CGI bin? Serverless. So, <laughs> I, 
<laughs> so I tell people, I tell, the, I tell young, you know, when I'm mentoring now, young developers are coming to the game and they want to be like, I, I want to have a career, I want to have longevity, uh, what, what is a good thing for me to learn how to do? And I say, learn about the difference between memory swapping and memory paging. And they go, well, what? Go, memory swapping and memory paging. Go, well, why do I need to learn that? Like, my pr programming language handles memory for me. And I go, yeah, but do you know what it's doing? Right? Now, I'm not saying that you need to be a manual memory management master. All right? I'm not saying that. I'm saying learn the difference between these two things. Because at some point in your career, the process of you having to have learned about those two things makes you a more complete technologist, even if you never use those things, right? Learning fundamentals is important because it helps you to build that experience and knowledge base that, that maybe, again, you never apply directly, but later on, you're going to go, wait a minute, why is it that RabbitMQ is consuming like nine gigs of memory? And you go and you look on the machine, and you're like, ah, it's swapping, and I know what the difference is, and I can fix that. Cool, right? Good, solid, fundamental knowledge help you do your job better. Uh, the basics are critical, but the other thing about the basics is you don't want to be dogmatic about fundamentals. And this is actually super, super important. And it's a trap people fall into at all experience levels and all age levels and all background levels, right? Is you learn a thing for the first time and you go, oh, I figured it out. I am the greatest programmer alive! Right? And it's like, no, it's cool. Like, you just, you wrote void and you made a construct out of it. Like, that's not, <laughs> you know. Um, the simple fact of the matter is, and you know, we talk about Dunning-Kruger and all this stuff. It's super fun. But there, there's no, like, silver bullet. Or, or better yet, there's no perfect truth. Right? This is not a philosophy seminar. Okay? There's no perfect truth. Uh, people come from different backgrounds. Right? They come from, from, from different experience levels. They have different takes on what fundamentals are and how they should be applied. Okay? And that is good and true and normal. All right? You can't be dogmatic about it. And that actually leads me to learning number seven, which is embracing diversity. Okay? This is super, super critical, both in the fight game as well as, as in the tech game. Uh, there are literally no downsides to this, okay? Diversity is the core tenet of mixed martial arts. It's literally the point, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, it, that's it. Be like, all, all I want to do, all I want to do is jab. I want to do nothing else but that. Well, okay, I mean, eh. But wait a minute, what if I jabbed and also kicked? Would that be a thing? Could I do, okay, oh, all of a sudden, diversity is making us stronger and better. Interesting how that works, right? Diversity makes you better by default. There are no downsides to learning different techniques and training different situations. It makes you a more complete fighter. Uh, and when we talk about fundamentals, and I said the fundamentals can be applied in different ways and learned different ways and, and so on and so forth. This is important. Uh, take the jab, which I evoked earlier. So if anybody's never seen a jab before, it's sort of the basic unit of all striking martial arts, right? Where you square up in your stance and you throw a jab, right? It's just a straight punch. It's thrown with your off hand. It's very, very simple, okay? The thing is, is there's a zillion ways to do it. It's the most basic possible unit of English boxing, box anglaise. But there's a ton of ways to do it. There's up jabs and chicken jabs and side jabs and run. Ah, oh, it's freaking crazy, right? And there's... Even if you only learn one way to do it and you get really, really good at that one way, like say you know how to throw an up jab and you're like the master of throwing an up jab. If you throw an up jab at me two or three times, I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to counter you, and that's it. Your fight's over. Right? So we talk about fundamentals, learn the fundamentals, but be diverse about it. Don't be dogmatic about it. Okay? And tech needs diversity to succeed in the same way that you need diversity in the MMA game. For example, take building a user interface of any type, literally any type, okay? On any screen, physical device, doesn't matter what it is, some sort of human-machine interface. It is a minefield 
of usability concerns. All right? Uh, Rory actually touched on this a ton yesterday, which is really cool. His talk was excellent, by the way. There he is. There's the man. I just evoked his name and he walks into the room as if we planned it. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, for the record, your talk yesterday was excellent. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, but it's, you know, it's a minefield of usability concerns, vision concerns, right? Cultural expectations on what different colors and symbols mean. The list is endless and no one person can know them all. It's impossible. And, and that's why you need to have a diverse group of people helping you to build that UI. You need people with different backgrounds and different experiences and, and different concerns and different needs and different expectations because that's how you're gonna get a complete product, right? If you don't have that, you're gonna be failing somebody, and there's a good chance that that somebody you're failing is a significant percentage of your customer base. End of story, all right? Now, you don't have to believe me on this, all right? There's actually a ton of excellent peer-reviewed science on the subject of diversity uh, in, 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 in industry in general, and in tech in particular, so, Go ye to the Googles, read some PDFs, it's gonna be fine, all right? Uh, but the fact of the matter is that fresh eyes and, and fresh ideas, especially in the world of testing and QA, uh, are, are gonna build you a better product. So diversity is important. So once you have the solid fundamentals, okay, and you've got a diverse group assembled, and you're well rested, all right, and you're well fed, and you're injury free, what can you do? with this power. Well, it's time to execute, which brings us to learning number eight, penetration testing. Who here has done some pen testing, actually, just out of curiosity? A couple of hands go up? Cool, I love pen testing. Pen testing, penetration testing, for those maybe not familiar with the term, is the sweet science of evaluating computer systems uh, in order to identify weaknesses and vulnerabilities in those systems, hopefully before the bad actors do, right? And, and hopefully, you're not a bad actor, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's not something you learn to do directly. You don't go to school to learn how to do pen testing, right? I can't open a book called Pen Testing for Dummies. Note to self, write pen testing for dummies. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a series of actions and reactions that require knowledge and experience to undertake successfully, right? The, the idea is, is when you start the penetrate penetration testing, you know, you, start, you sit down in front of the computer and we go, I'm going to do the pen test, right? It, it, it's not one thing. It's a collection of things, right? And it's the same thing with fighting. You don't learn to fight. It's impossible to teach someone how to fight. It doesn't exist, okay? Uh, fighting, like pen testing, is the culmination of thousands of factors manifested into a series of actions honed to a single point in time. And what is that single point in time? It's a loop, right? And that loop is observe, adapt, and act, or react. Sometimes you have to do that loop really quickly, right? Uh, if, 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 if I'm scoring off against someone and they're punching me, I have to do this real fast, <laughs> okay, real fast. And in pen testing, sometimes you have to be real fast about it too. Uh, so as a fighter, I'm aware of the fact that everybody has strengths and weaknesses, right? And some of them I can know ahead of time. Maybe I've reviewed tape, right? Tape, of course, not tape anymore, but that's what it's still called. Reviewed footage uh, of their fights, or I know somebody, or I've trained with them in the past, I know something about them. So, you know, I can figure out how to put together a strategy, put together some tactics, right? Same thing with pen testing. If I know something about the target, then I can start to put together a strategy. I know it's a Windows machine, I know it's running Apache, right? Okay, cool but there's a ton of stuff that I'm not gonna be able to know ahead of time about my opponent. And so how do I figure that out? We well, gotta do it on the spot, right? And uh, there's a feeling out process sometimes at the start of fights where you know, you're throwing feints, right? Instead of like actually throwing the jab, I'm gonna make it look like I'm about to. Uh, give them different looks. Got to get the bites on level changes, right? Make it look like I'm going for a double or a single and then pull back and see how they react to that. And the idea is, is to get my opponent to react so that I can figure out how to do the opposite of what they expect, right? Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm not very good at it. 
I just want to let you all know right now. <laughs> okay? But that's the idea, all right? And once I can read that reaction, I can exploit it. Uh, the trick there is, is to not make it obvious, okay? Uh, I need to switch up my attack and my stance because they're doing the same thing to me. And so it's this cat and mouse game where I know that they know that I know that they know. Ah, crap. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like Princess Bride. You know, with the cups, right? You never go in uh, if the life from the Sicilian, when life is on the line or something like this. The idea is that you're just getting started. And you need to be less predictable. And, and in the world of pen testing, it's the same thing, oddly enough. And this is something that took me a little while to understand. Especially if you're, if you're working with security-aware systems, uh, it can be a nightmare. Take Nmap. Nmap's a network you know, mapping tool. It's called Nmap. You can actually run this on the command line. It's really cool. It has a bunch of operating patterns to obfuscate the scan itself, right? So if I start uh, a simple TCP scan, port scan, I start at port 1, and I go all the way up to 65,535, as fast as I can, basically a mini moderately complex system is going to go, I'm <laughs> being scanned. <laughs> Firewall, right? So I have to change the way I'm approaching the system. And sometimes that means I have to probe it in different ways, and I have to use different tools, right? And I, and I have to, to react to what I'm seeing to get the data I want out of it. And that actually brings me to learning number nine, which is plan to change plans. You have a phrase in the MMA game which is called working percentages. And it's impossible to know what my opponent's going to do. It's impossible, okay? But knowing what they can do, knowing what they're likely to do, is critical. If I'm grappling with somebody and they try a triangle choke and I know that you can transition from a triangle to a straight arm bar, then my high percentage defensive move is to defend against both the triangle and the arm bar. It's okay, right? The, the idea is to have an understanding of what is possible and what is likely to be possible. And the same thing computer system if I'm doing penetration testing. The more I know about the target, the more I can steer my investigations in the right direction. If I know it's a Windows box, I'm not going to try Linux exploits. That's a waste of time, right? But I need to be open to new information. I need to be able to, s to, 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 to not let my predefined ideas cloud my activity. The simple fact of the matter is, is that any data that validates your model is a trap, and you, you should look at it askance. Because data that challenges your model is a gift, right? That's where the really interesting things happen, right? When you see new data and you go, this thing that I thought before doesn't appear to be correct, you should be aiming directly at that, okay? Anything that backs up what you thought going into it is dangerous. This is something I learned from MMA, and it's something that served me well in my career, right? Aim at the thing that doesn't make sense, because that's the interesting thing, right? So you, you have a plan, you have a way to approach, you, you have a strategy, you have tactics, you go, this is what I know I'm going to do, and I know that even if my ideas are going to be challenged, I, I've got a mental model for, for how to handle those ideas being challenged, and that brings me to the last learning, learning number 10 which is dealing with it. Great quote by a very controversial figure in the form of Mike Tyson. But <laughs> he said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, <laughs> sometimes things happen, all right? And you just have to do the best you can with the situation you've got. That's what MMA taught me about working in tech. Thank you very much, everybody. I don't know if we have time for questions or if there are any questions. We sure. We have time for a few questions. <laughs> I know it's not like a computer talk, so it might be difficult to come up with questions for that, but it's okay. You can come chat afterwards if you like. I could also ask you about martial arts. You could ask me about martial arts if you like, sure. Bridget? Thank you, Dan. That was great. I have a question about that last point, which is to say, not you know, from a hum humorous point of view, but which is to say, it almost feels like there is a coda there. Okay, deal with it, 
and then what when you when something becomes overwhelming mm -hmm. what happens then what do you uh, recommend yeah well i would say if something becomes overwhelming the first thing you do is, is try not to cry and then you cry a little <laughs> and that's okay <laughs> right that's fine it's, it's totally okay uh and and then you basically fall back on everything i was talking about right if you put all those ducks in a row right that with with putting yourself surrounding yourself with the right people and being in the right environment and 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 being aware of the importance of self-care right and and having those diverse experiences and and knowing that the fundamentals are set that even when when you you have this intractable problem in front of you right you're not one you're not alone and two you feel confident that you have what you need to overcome that situation. Now, I'm not saying this is easy, <laughs> right? And I'm not saying this is automatic, because none of it is. But if you put yourself in the right place and, and you take care of yourself, and you have people that are in the right place and they're taking care of themselves, your chances of being able to deal with that situation are much greater. Do we have time for one more? I don't know yes. if we do. It says Last over here time. my time's up, so. That's OK. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, taking into consideration that, like, you want to stick to your fundamentals, but you want to be diverse, um, I suppose if you persevere, it's a little bit easier for you based on your mindset, right? But I suppose it gets difficult when you're trying to get a team to become diverse, because you're always going to get somebody that maybe they know how to jab and they just don't want to kick because every time they kick, they fall. <laughs> <laughs> well, if every time you kick, you fall, you need somebody to teach you how to kick. Right? So, I, I know that sounds like I'm dodging your question, but, but yeah, that's, that's it. You know, um, if, if you're in an environment... Uh, look, I'm going to give you some bad news. All right? If you're in an environment where, where nobody's sleeping, and everybody looks the same and acts the same, you need to find a different environment. I don't know if you can change that on your own. I've never seen it done successfully. Um, that requires top-down and bottom-up. It requires investiture. It requires cultural shifts and cultural changes. It requires money, and it requires people that want to see it happen. And if you're the one person in a sea of people who don't, you're the one who needs to change, not them. And it sucks. All right, but hard truths. <laughs> All right. Wow, that was a downer. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off the stage. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.